We must believe in God based on his word. Genesis chapter 4 verses 1 to 5. Now Adam knew Eve his wife and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Then she bore again, this time his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. Genesis chapter 4 describes the very first sacrifice that mankind offered to God. Adam and Eve, the first ancestors of mankind, were driven out of the Garden of Eden after sinning against God and they gave birth to two children, one named Cain and the other Abel. Eventually, these two sons came to have occupations and one became a farmer, while the other became a shepherd. It came to pass that these two men brought offerings to God. Cain, a farmer, brought the fruit of the ground as his offering, while Abel, a stockman, sacrificed the firstborn of the flock and their fat as his offering to God. However, while God accepted Abel's offering, he rejected Cain's offering. As a result, the Bible says that Cain got very angry and his countenance fell. Even today, people continue to worship God. However, as it was said that God did not accept Cain's offering because he had brought the fruit of the ground, we see today that there also are many Christians who worship like Cain. Many Christians are worshipping God with their own carnal things, that is, by bringing their own will, religious devotion, patience, sacrifice and good deeds as their offerings to God. That is the same as the offering that Cain brought. If you offer your own merits to God, will he receive them in pleasure? No, of course not. God will reject any offering of the flesh no matter what. Therefore, Christians should recognise that those who bring their own piety as their offering to God are ultimately worshipping in vain and leading a mistaken life of faith. Although the events recorded in today's scripture passage happened ages ago, even now most Christians are still worshipping God in vain like Cain. Cain took the fruit of the ground as his offering to God in vain. Like this, for Christians to offer prayers of repentance after sinning is also in vain. Such an act is something that belongs to Cain's worship. Does sin disappear just by offering prayers of repentance? Can anyone's sins be blotted out just by believing in the blood of the cross? No, that is not the case. No one's sins are blotted out just because he blindly offers his own devotion as his offering to God like Cain. But for those of us who know and believe in the gospel truth of the water and the spirit, all our sins have disappeared from our hearts, for the Lord has already blotted them out. It is such a tragedy that most of today's Christians are worshipping like Cain. They think that they have been made sinless by believing in the blood of the cross blindly and they approach God recklessly, relying on their own prayers of repentance, even though sin is not something that can be blotted out just by offering prayers of repentance. Unless one believes in the gospel of the water and the spirit given by Jesus, his sins can never be blotted out through his own religious zeal, will, devotion or prayers of repentance. Yet many Christians still continue to believe in God like this and this saddens me deeply. They keep giving Cain's offering endlessly even though they know themselves that it's all in vain. 
They don't accept the truth even when it's taught and they worship blindly with only their own devotion. The reason why they insist on Cain's offering so stubbornly is because they think that they also have something to offer to God, that is, the fruit of the ground. Since there are martyrs among their forefathers of faith, some of whom lost everything to keep the Sabbath day holy, they are proud of their predecessors of faith and seek to emulate them in leading their lives of faith. However, how could anyone receive the remission of sins without believing in the word of the water and the spirit? Can you be redeemed from your sins just by believing in the blood of the cross alone without believing in the gospel of the water and the spirit? Can you be remitted from your sins by offering prayers of repentance every day? It is impossible to receive the remission of sins without believing in this gospel of truth. No matter how determined you are to never commit any sin again and live an upright life, you cannot blot out your sins with your own efforts. If your faith is a mistaken one, not the truth of God, then you can never receive the remission of your sins, regardless of how hard you might try to live a godly life. So how could anyone be redeemed from sin without believing in the gospel of the water and the spirit? This present age is the very time when the gospel of the water and the spirit is indeed desperately needed all the more. It is in times like today when ethics and morals are lost, the norms of the world are all undermined and every legalistic faith has collapsed that the gospel of the water and the spirit is truly necessary. Living in such a world that makes it inevitable for mankind to live bound by sin, how could anyone then receive the remission of sins without believing in the gospel of the water and the spirit? Christianity has been crumbling down. What is worse, the absolute majority of today's Christians are still leading their lives of faith like Cain. These are the people who just believe in the blood of the cross alone, professing their faith only with their lips and trying to receive the remission of their daily sins by offering prayers of repentance every day. However, while one should admit his sins to God, these sins are not blotted out just by begging him. Even though Cain brought the fruit of the ground as his offering to God, God did not accept it. Likewise, no sin is ever blotted out just by offering prayers of repentance. It is impossible to remove sin just by believing in the blood of the cross alone and offering prayers of repentance. This world is now filled with iniquities. As Satan has poured evil transgressions, the whole world is now whirling in iniquities. Sin has prevailed so much that people now no longer consider sin as sin. Can you overcome sin in such a world all on your own? Just how godly a life can you live that you would try to receive the remission of your sins by diligently offering prayers of repentance and sanctifying yourself? Put differently, without the offering of faith that Abel brought to God, without this kind of faith, how could you possibly receive the remission of your sins? You've probably seen how insane it gets when a heavy metal group holds a concert these days. Today's youth swarm such events like bees and the performers and the crowd alike all go crazy. The spectators don't just sit there quietly to listen, but they engage in all kinds of weird acts. Men and women alike, they are all over each other, dancing and screaming. Those on the stage strip down and do all kinds of antics. They all seem to have gone almost completely insane. But would Christians really stay away from such places just because they are Christians? The current of the times has changed radically. It has now become an age when no one can live a quiet life, even if he wanted to. 
Now is no longer the old age of the law, when the Pharisees and the rabbis wore long sleeves to hide what should not be seen. At that time, the culture of sin had not prevailed so much as it is now, and so when someone committed sin somehow, it was still possible for him to sacrifice a sin offering to God and live with a renewed heart. In sharp contrast, now is an age that is overflowing with sin, and so it's simply impossible to keep yourself clean and not be tainted by iniquities. Just by turning on the TV, you see all kinds of sexually immoral scenes. How would it then be possible to guard your heart and live a virtuous life when everything is a product of the culture of sin? Moreover, with the development of the internet, nowadays there are all kinds of filth floating around the net that can be easily accessed just at a click of the mouse. It's said that even elementary and junior high school students visit adult sites quite often. For someone like me, who have never been to such a site nor have any interest, the names of some of these sites alone are scandalous enough. When parents discover that their children have been browsing through sexually explicit sites and rebuke them by saying, don't you ever do this again, the children would just say, this is nothing, it doesn't even qualify as an explicit site. This is the kind of age that we are now living. Because we are living in such a corrupt age, it is very difficult for us to live a godly life. Indeed, only Jesus Christ can truly save us from sin. No one can be saved unless through this gospel of the water and the spirit given by the Lord. How could anyone achieve this? By offering prayers of repentance? By giving prayers of confession? By living a godly life? This is all complete nonsense. Through the offering of the fruit of the ground that Cain brought, it is impossible to receive the remission of sins. Cain offered the fruit of the ground to God, but God did not accept it. This implies that Cain was unable to receive the remission of sins. What is it meant by offering the fruit of the ground? This is what it means. Believing according to your own will. Believing only as a matter of religion. Believing according to the teachings of men that your forefathers of faith used to believe. Believing according to your own thoughts, rather than according to the truth of the Bible and trying to offer God something of your own and establish your own merit, instead of following him by faith. All these things stem from the kind of faith that offers the fruit of the ground like Cain did. Now as before, there are two types of faith in this world, the faith of Abel and the faith of Cain. Each faith of these two men was expressed by the offering they gave. The Bible says that Abel, unlike Cain, sacrificed to God the firstborn of the flock and their fat. Who is the firstborn of the flock? It is Jesus Christ. What is the fact here? It is the Holy Spirit. To save us, God sent his only begotten son to this earth and made him accept all the sins of mankind by being baptised. Thus shouldering the sins of the world, Jesus Christ was then crucified, shed his blood to death and thereby saved us all from our sins. We must believe in this truth. Abel, who had offered the sacrifice of faith to God, not only received the remission of sins, but was also accepted by God. Indeed, were it not for our faith in the gospel of the water and the spirit, how else would we be able to receive the remission of sins? By what possible means would we be redeemed? How on earth would we be able to become sinless? My fellow believers, can we receive the remission of our sins through Cain's offering? No, it's impossible. However, most Christians are holding fast to a preposterous faith. 
their catechism has a chapter titled How to Receive the Remission of Sins and it explains that the remission of sins is received by offering prayers of repentance. In other words, it claims that when a Christian commits sin, he must offer prayers of repentance, trusting in the precious blood of the Lord on the cross, look toward this precious blood and live with the conviction on his side that the Lord has remitted away even the sins he just committed. It teaches that Christians should have the conviction that the Lord has remitted away their sins every time they offer prayers of repentance. Pastors teach that Christians must be convinced on their part that the Lord would infallibly remit away their sins if they offered prayers of repentance, insisting that they must have unconditional conviction even without any base. When pastors teach like this, their congregations are convinced, well, since my pastor is saying so, it must be true, and believe accordingly. But even if they are convinced of this, saying, I believe so, and offer prayers of repentance with every confidence, do their sins really disappear from their hearts? When they have never passed their sins to Jesus, can they really be convinced that their hearts are truly sinless? No, they can't be sure of this. Sin is blotted out justly only if its price is paid off. Without paying off its wages, it is never blotted out. When it comes to paying off the wages of sin, it is Jesus Christ who has paid off all the wages. If you ignore the fact that the Lord has completely paid off all the wages of sin and just convince yourself blindly, I am sinless, you will not become truly sinless. When the Lord came to this earth, he accepted all our sins by being baptised and he was condemned for all our sins on the cross. Had he not done this, it would have been impossible for our sins to be blotted out, no matter how hard we might try. Just because you are convinced on your own that the Lord has remitted away all your sins, even as you are ignorant of the truth, does this mean that you have no sin? No, of course not. How could your sins disappear just because you believe on your own? I am sure that the Lord has somehow remitted away all my sins. Is it because the Lord has blotted out all our sins that we now have no sin? Or are we now sinless all because of our own conviction, irrespective of what the Lord has done for us? We are sinless because of our Lord. It's because the Lord came to this earth on his part, was baptised for us, accepted the sins of the world, shouldered them to the cross, died on it and has thereby washed away all our sins that we have become sinless by believing in this truth. It's precisely because the Lord has blotted out our sins first that we have now been made sinless by knowing and accepting that he has indeed removed all our sins. In other words, because of all that the Lord has done for us, our sins could disappear as we realised this truth and believed in it. We could never say that we have no sin if we did not know the baptism of Jesus nor believed in it. We have no sin at all because of the fact that God himself has blotted out all our sins. God accepted Abel's sacrifice that was offered with the firstborn of the flock and their fat. God sent his only begotten son to this earth and he made his son accept all our sins by being baptised by John the Baptist, carry them to the cross and die on it. In doing so, God has blotted out all our sins. He had decided to eradicate all our sins with this method and this is indeed how he blotted them out. Therefore, it is only by believing in this truth that we are made sinless. Everything else is all in vain, no matter how ardently we might believe in Jesus on our own, how we might offer all our gold, silver and precious possessions to him, and how we might even jump into the fire for someone else. 
Even if we swear that we believe in Jesus and determine ourselves to never commit any sin again, would our sins really disappear? Just because we have our own unshakable conviction that God has remitted away all our sins, does this really mean that our sins would disappear, even if we don't believe in the baptism and the blood of Jesus? No, that is never the case. It is nothing more than our own human will. Today, many Christians profess to believe that Jesus blotted out all our sins and bore all our condemnation by shedding his blood on the cross. But how long does this conviction actually last? For a day? For a week? Can our conviction last longer than a month? Perhaps two or three years for those who are convinced even more? Some people do retain this conviction for many years. Nevertheless, it does not last forever. Any human conviction that is not founded on the word is a fruit of the earth and therefore it is inevitably bound to be corrupted in time. When I look at today's Christians, I get very frustrated. That's because so many of them are like Cain. Every time I speak of the gospel, I can't help but comment on this frustrating reality. Even at this very moment, there are countless people blindly shouting out Amen over such preposterous teachings and praising God with their emotion all stirred up. The hymn, Jesus Keep Me Near the Cross, goes, In the cross, in the cross, be my glory ever, till my raptured soul shall find rest beyond the river. Christians usually sing this hymn filled with emotion. But just because someone praises Jesus filled with his own emotion, this does not mean that he would accept such praise. Yet despite this, too many people praise like this. Rather than stirring up our own emotion, we must first receive the remission of sins by believing in the gospel truth of the water and the spirit and then praise God to thank him for this blessing. Because the Lord loved us first, he came to this earth to blot out our sins, accepted all the sins of the world by being baptised, went to the cross to shed his precious blood and pay off all the wages of our sins and has thereby saved us perfectly. Because we know and believe in this truth, we praise him with thanksgiving from the depth of our hearts. In other words, because the Creator has blotted out all our sins first, even when we commit transgressions or fall into sin, we can still keep the grace of the remission of sins by our faith. Because Jesus has blotted out all our sins, we have received our salvation by faith and even if we sometimes fall into weaknesses and commit sin after receiving the remission of our sins, we are still sinless, for we believe in the truth that the Lord has blotted out even this sin. The truth that the Lord has blotted out all the sins of mankind was established first, and therefore it is by believing in this truth that we have received the remission of our sins. If you don't even know what the perfect sacrifice of atonement that Jesus the Lamb offered is, and yet you praise God in tears, overwhelmed by your own emotion, would this really constitute true worship? Does God accept such praise and worship? No, that is nothing more than rattling all by yourself, not the kind of praise or worship that is acceptable to God. Even the so-called Christian intellectuals get so emotional that they put their own feelings before everything else and profess to believe in Jesus blindly. But does God really accept them? No, God does not accept any worship that is offered in such a fleshly way. Purporting to worship God, Cain brought the fruit of the ground. He worshipped God with all kinds of the fruits of the ground piled up, from potatoes, corns, apples and so on. But did God accept them or was he pleased with them? No, neither did his offering please him nor did he accept it. 
In fact, this was most offensive to God. God does not like it when people bring the things of their own flesh, that is, the fruit of their own devotion and sweat. What God likes is a sacrificial offering. He likes it when a sinner passes his sins to his sacrificial animal by laying his hands on its head, when the blood of the animal is put on the horns of the altar of burnt offering and poured on the ground, and when the flesh of this animal is burnt. This offering, in which a sacrificial animal accepts one's sins and dies in his place, is called the sacrifice of atonement. God is pleased when the sacrificial animal pays off the wages of sin. God accepts the offering of those who give the sacrifice of faith like this and it is such people whom God approves as sinless. Everyone must offer the sacrifice that pleases God. If you sacrifice to God an offering that does not please him like Cain did, then he will not accept it in pleasure. Cain had offered the fruit of the ground that he had attained by tilling the field diligently for a full year, but did God accept it? No, he did not. Why didn't God accept Cain's offering? That's because it was not the offering that God wanted. Because human beings have sinned against God, they must be put to death for their sins, according to the law of God. So given this, if someone just brings a mountain of the fruit of his own acts and offers it to God, asking him to forgive his sins, could God accept this and blot out his sins? No, that's not the case. The law of God makes it clear that the wages of sin is death. It's precisely because the wages of sin is death that a sacrificial offering is indispensable. In other words, we absolutely need a sacrificial offering set by God that would die in our place. This offering of sacrifice for all mankind was none other than Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God. When Jesus Christ came to this earth, he accepted the sins of the world by being baptised by John the Baptist, and while shouldering all these sins, he bore the condemnation of atonement for all our sins on the cross. It's because Jesus had shouldered all our sins through his baptism that he was punished for them on the cross. All of us must believe that Jesus has saved us in this way. When we come out to God by believing in this, God will accept this offering and receive us as well. In today's scripture passage, God accepted Abel and his offering precisely because he had this kind of faith. Cain, in contrast, did not offer the sacrifice demanded by God and that is why he was not accepted. Yet despite this, Christians all over the world still continue to worship God like Cain, taking the fruit of their own flesh as their offerings. The gospel of truth is in fact so clear-cut, yet even as it couldn't be any clearer what is the offering that pleases God, people still do not sacrifice this offering that is pleasing to him. The fact that Abel offered the firstborn of the flock and their fat manifests the true faith in the gospel, proclaiming that God has perfectly blotted out all our sins by sending his only begotten Son. God the Father sent his Son Jesus, who is also the true God, made him accept all our sins through his baptism and bear the condemnation of these sins by shedding his blood, and resurrected him in three days. In doing so, the Father raised his only begotten Son as our Saviour. If we know this Saviour and believe in him, then we will receive the remission of sins. When we admit to God that we are sinners destined to hell, believe that the Lord was baptised and shed his blood on the cross to save us and worship God with this faith, he will accept our worship in pleasure. God is pleased by such worship of faith. This is precisely the offering that pleases God. What is real goodness? Is it not to follow the will of God? No one is good but one, that is God. Luke chapter 18 verse 19. 
God alone is good. What goodness does any human being have? Are man's thoughts perfect? No, all human thoughts are imperfect and filthy. So given this, how could any will or devotion that stems from such human thoughts ever be virtuous? Put differently, the priority is not our own will or devotion, but we must first examine carefully the will of God. Whoever believes in this will of God is saved. However, many people reject this will and worship God like Cain. You may add all your devotion and efforts on top of the faith that's placed only in Jesus' blood on the cross. But would your sins really disappear then? No, of course not. God not only refused to accept this kind of sacrifice and offering, but he also rejected the one who offered it. What happened when Cain brought the fruit of the ground as his offering and God rejected it? The Bible says that his countenance fell. Even in this present age, there are so many people who offer the same offering of Cain. Just as Cain offered the fruit of the ground to God, many Christians come out to God and offer him their own will, devotion, merit and money. Even though they vow to God with a stiff neck and determined eye saying, I will live according to your will, don't their resolution and will all get broken in just a day or two? Indeed, their vows are all broken in little time, unable to last even for a few days. They then once again offer their prayers of repentance and they resolve themselves again saying, I will live a godly life no matter what. But does this renewed resolution last any longer? No, it will be broken all over again. Yet despite this, sadly, there are so many such people around us. My fellow believers, would you receive the remission of sins if you sacrifice to God like Cain? No, you won't. How can you then receive the remission of sins? All that you have to do is just offer the same sacrifice that Abel offered. Our Lord has remitted away all your sins and mine. By being baptised, shedding his blood on the cross and rising from the dead again, the Lord has remitted away all our sins. The only thing we have to do is just believe in this truth. Did we receive the remission of sins by offering prayers of repentance or by living virtuously? If one were to receive the remission of his sins by living a virtuous life, there would be no one left in the church. I myself would have to bid farewell and leave the church. Human beings are so insufficient and weak that all that they do is commit one sin after another. And so how could anyone ever receive the remission of sins if people are just told to attain it by living virtuously? Who would believe in the Lord? Who would follow him? It's because the Lord has remitted away all our sins that we believe in him and follow him. How else could we follow the Lord if we were told that we have to offer the fruits of the flesh to follow him? Abel's sacrifice that was offered with the firstborn of the flock and their fat is the revelation of our true salvation. God had promised to save us in this way. In other words, God had promised long ago that he would save us through his son Jesus Christ and he kept this promise. Jesus Christ, God himself, came to this earth, accepted all our sins by being baptised and was condemned on the cross to pay off the wages of our sins. It was God's providence of salvation for Jesus to save us by shouldering our sins through his baptism and by suffering death to pay off the wages of these sins. This is the gospel truth of the water and the spirit and it is by this method that our God has saved us. What then is it that we should do before this truth? There is nothing else to do but believe in the word of truth exactly as it is. 
If there is one thing that we must do indispensably, it is that we should always admit our wrongdoings to both God and man and believe in the gospel of the water and the spirit. All of us must do at least this one thing. The rest has been taken care of by Jesus Christ our Saviour who has solved away the problem of all our sins. Hasn't Jesus already solved it all away? Of course he has. It is by believing in this law that we have been saved. The truth is that our sins have disappeared precisely because the Lord has blotted them all out and it is because we believe in this that our hearts have now become sinless. Even though this is the clear truth that saves mankind, it's so frustrating to see that so many people still can't believe in it. When time passes by, such hardened hearts should be changed at least a bit, but there is no sign of any change at all. Even though we have preached the gospel of the water and the spirit diligently, people still continue to insist stubbornly on only the sacrifice of Cain. If there is one thing that has changed, it is just that there are now more people claiming to be sinless, even though their hearts still remain sinful. In other words, more and more people claim that one can become sinless just by believing in Jesus even if he doesn't believe in his baptism. That is about the only change that we can observe. This implies that the descendants of Cain now have some clues about the mystery of salvation but not the whole truth. They realise that it's possible for one to become sinless and so in this respect they have at least learned one lesson but they still do not know precisely how this is achieved. One should say that he is sinless only when he knows and believes in the baptism of Jesus. Without this, just by claiming to be sinless blindly, is anyone really made sinless? No, of course not. We have preached the gospel so tirelessly that we feel exhausted but despite all our hard work many Christians all over the world and especially in Korea have changed so little. To the extent that they continue to ignore the will of God and believe in him arbitrarily on their own nothing has changed. As we have preached the gospel so much, we had high hopes, thinking that the descendants of Cain would have changed at least a little bit, but Christians in Korea have not changed at all. On the contrary, they seem to have turned even more uninterested in the truth. What about you? Have Christians around you changed? Is there anyone who has changed other than those who have received the remission of their sins? No, their faith is the same all the time. In 2002, there was an international Christian convention held in Korea and the head pastor of the convention gave a sermon saying, we have to be born again of water and the spirit, but what is water here? It is the amniotic fluid of pregnant women. If the contents of the sermon given to the gathering of the so-called Christian leaders of the world were so nonsensical, what kind of fellowship would they have had? They would have talked about nothing else but only how one has to live faithfully, be pious and believe with a strong will to be born again. We must awaken those who are asleep. There still are too many people who do not know the gospel of the water and the spirit and there still are too many places where we must spread this gospel. There are so many people around us who must be born again. Way too many Christians believe in vain all because they still do not know this truth. In other words, there are countless Christians misguided by false prophets who are not born again. They are offering Cain's sacrifice every day without even realising its fallacy themselves. Aware of the fact that there still are many people worshipping like Cain, we must lead them to turn around and have the faith of Abel. Did we receive the remission of sins because of our own merits? No, that's not true.
It's because the Lord has blotted out all our sins with his water and blood that we have received the remission of our sins by believing in this. That is right. And this is the very faith of Abel. My fellow believers, let us then all have the same faith as that of Abel and let us also preach this faith. The word of God revealed in Genesis chapter 4 still remains in effect even now. Because God's word is the everlasting truth, it transcends time and space and it still remains true and effective. The word of God is the living word that continues to be effective for everyone even now. Just how many people on this earth are like Cain? There are so many. That's why there is so much work for us to do. Since we have to preach the gospel to every corner of the entire world, even if all of you were full-time workers of the gospel, there still would not be enough workers. My fellow believers, we must work united together so that Satan may not find any opportunity to attack us. Rather than being self-centred, we should first set our hearts on what God has told us and follow him with this priority. I admonish you all to know what God has said and believe in it, to worship him by faith and to carry out his work. You and I must escape from self-centred faith and always seek the life of faith that is centred on God. God has saved us through the gospel of the water and the spirit. Believing in this, whatever we do, whether we eat or drink, we should live for the glory of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 31. We should follow the Lord with such a determination. If you are self-centred, then you can end up like Cain at any time. But if you free yourself from your self-centred faith and let your faith be centred on God, then you can always be at peace with God and live with his blessings. You and I can all achieve this. You and I must always stand on Abel's side. We must never stand on Cain's side. While Cain was powerful and strong-willed, he was self-centred. Abel, on the other hand, was an insufficient man, but he nonetheless acknowledged his fragility and lived out his faith by placing it in God, and that is why he became a father of faith to us. Abel was martyred to defend the right faith while trying to lead his brother Cain to the right way. As we too have Abel's faith, by this faith we must also rise up to lead the descendants of Cain to the truth and plant Abel's faith in their hearts.